Hi, I'm Mary Kopsinski, the CEO of Regolytics. Happy holidays and welcome to this week's regulatory roundup. Since December 11th, there have been 256 updates related to financial services in the United States. Join us on our YouTube channel to see the extended version of this video. The regulator of the week is FinCEN. The Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network was created out of the Patriot Act in 2001, which was a response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. The mission of FinCEN is to safeguard the financial system from illicit use, combat money laundering, and promote national security through the strategic use of financial authorities and the collection, analysis, and dissemination of financial intelligence. Over this week and last, a number of exchanges and self-regulating organizations have been updating their onboarding manuals to include certain customer due diligence requirements that have been mandated by FinCEN's recent rule. In a recent address discussing the organization's accomplishments, the director of FinCEN, Kenneth Blanco, reiterated the importance of beneficial ownership to national security. It's important that you know your customer, and if your customer is a company, you really need to know who owns that company. And in the event that that company is owned by another company, you really need to drill down all the way through until you get to the humans behind the organizations. This is no small task for financial institutions, but it must be done. He also talked about the impact of FinCEN's May guidance on convertible virtual currencies. While FinCEN expected the number of suspicious activity reports to go up, what they were not expecting is the number of unique entities filing suspicious activity reports most of the time for their very first time. There were over 2,100 unique filers all over the world since that May guidance. The topic of the week is the CRA. The Community Reinvestment Act is a federal law enacted in 1977 to encourage depository institutions to meet the credit needs of low and moderate income neighborhoods. The CRA requires federal regulators to assess how well each of the banks fulfills its obligations to these communities. Well, today, the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency announced a proposal to modernize the agency's regulations under the CRA that have not been substantively addressed for over 25 years. The proposals will clarify what qualifies as credit under the CRA, enabling banks and their partners to better implement reinvestment and other activities that can benefit communities. First, the proposed rule will eliminate guessing by community members and banks as to what counts as a CRA credit by articulating clear standards and publish illustrative examples of qualifying activities. Second, banks that draw a large portion of their deposits outside of their local operating area will have revised standards for the assessments. Third, the proposal would evaluate CRA performance more objectively, analyzing actual impact of the low middle income activities compared to the rest of the business. Fourth, the proposal will improve the transparency and timeliness of reporting. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin applauded the OCC and the FDIC, saying that the CRA needed a refresh after 40 years. In contrast, Senator Sherrod Brown of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee said, Today's proposal undermines a basic principle we agreed to in this country nearly 50 years ago, that banks should serve their customers and their communities. In 2019, it is shameful that Trump regulators are ready to cast aside that principle and trample on a fundamental civil rights law the Community Reinvestment Act by pushing aside those who most need access to the banking system, including communities of color and rural communities. In other news, the CFTC issued two major amendments related to commodity pool operators 
and commodity trading advisors. A commodity pool operator is a salesperson for a fund that invests in commodity futures. A CPO can work for a hedge fund or an investment fund, but they take positions in commodities and CPOs must register with the Commodities Future Trading Commission. The new rules expand on existing no action letters, which means that there are certain entities they are now clarifying are not commodity pool operators. So happy holidays. The exemptees that are proposed to be not commodity pool operators are entities that operate registered investment advisors as well as family offices. So congrats to you, you are not commodity pool operators. The Federal Housing and Finance Authority is requesting comment on a proposed rule that would change stress testing. For one, it's going to increase the minimum threshold for people having to register stress reports to be 250 billion up from 10 billion. So that will reduce the number of people who even have to produce these resolution plans. Additionally, they're going to get rid of the adverse scenario. Now that is a very specific change, but those of you who are following resolution recovery rules know that that is a dramatic reduction in the amount of writing that has to go into these reports and would essentially cut them down by a third. Some of these resolution plans are over 8,000 pages long, so a cut of a third is many reams of paper. For those of you following privacy rules, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000 requires those subject to this rule have to provide privacy and opt-out notices to customers and to adopt appropriate policies and procedures to safeguard customer records and information. The CFTC is announcing an opportunity for the public to comment on the method that the CFTC asks for proof of compliance in this area. In Crypto Corner, the SEC busted a digital asset entrepreneur that had raised over $42 million from over 100 investors in an ICO. The shopping tokens, they were called, was going to create universal shopper profiles maintained in the blockchain that would track customer purchases and histories across online retailers. But apparently, the company never actually created a functional platform and the owner misappropriated the funds for his personal use, including at least $500,000 used for rent, shopping, entertainment expenses, and a dating service. Speaking of love, Regolytics has now added insurance to our US Alerts product. So for those of you following insurance, here's a fun one for you. The California Department of Insurance busted a woman for felony insurance fraud through shenanigans on the wedding website, The Knot. She apparently booked a wedding reception with a $10,000 insurance cancellation policy. She then made a claim saying she had tripped on her wedding dress and was injured so terribly she had to cancel the wedding. In an interesting twist, she emailed the insurance company claiming that her check had been stolen. She then produced a doctored police report from something that had happened years before and they caught her. She was sentenced to five years in a county jail and ordered to pay $22,500 in restitution. Also in insurance, the Fed proposes to establish risk-based capital requirements for certain insurance companies that are supervised by the board. Well, last week, the Fed announced an extension to the comment period. So if this is an area you're following, you still have until January 22nd of next year to give them your feedback. In Cannabis Corner, Washington State issued a final rule this week around vaping products and licensing requirements. It allows for the inspection of vaping products, both regular and cannabis. It clarifies tax rules, and it also indicates that this rule does not apply to cannabis products unless they're in a vaping mechanism. On behalf of the entire Regolytics team, we wish you a very happy holiday. 
Our gift to you is a discount on your subscription for 2020. All you have to do is go to www.regolytics.ai and sign up for a free trial and I will get you your discount. I am heading home for the holidays, so I will see you on LinkedIn and YouTube starting on January 8th.